Hello, and welcome to the Wilson Center's webcast, Protecting Antarctica in the Postponed Super Year of Nature. My name is David Balton. I am a senior fellow at the Wilson Center's Polar Institute, and I'm most pleased to serve as the moderator for today's event, which we are convening in partnership with the Pew Charitable Trusts. Prior to the onset of the pandemic, most people involved uh, with efforts to protect the world's ocean and to conserve its resources had looked forward to this year, 2020, as the year of nature. A whole raft of high-level events on the calendar for this year held the promise of creating real change. But sadly, the pandemic has caused the postponement or cancellation of most of those events. But the need to act remains. And one of the key remaining opportunities for meaningful action this year concerns the waters around Antarctica, the Southern Ocean. This November, nations concerned with the so Southern Ocean have the chance to establish three new marine protected areas, one in East Antarctica, one in the Weddell Sea, and one in the vicinity of the Antarctic Peninsula, all told almost 4 million square kilometers of ocean space. Today's event features three remarkable people, each in their own way have worked tirelessly in support of ocean conservation efforts. They are Louis Pugh, an endurance swimmer and UN patron of the ocean who pioneers swims in the most vulnerable ecosystems on the earth. His many feats, among his many feats, Louis was the first person to swim across the North Pole and the first person to swim the length of the English Channel. Jose Maria Figueras was a former president of Costa Rica and co-founder of Ocean Unite. Jose Maria has become a world leader on ocean issues, one of the founders of the Global Ocean Commission and a stalwart champion of protecting ocean spaces. And Andrew Kavanaugh, director of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Conservation of the Pew Charitable Trusts. Andrea, trusted friend and colleague of mine, who worked for many years to protect the waters around Antarctica. You can find the full bios of each of these remarkable people on our website today. But to kick off today's event, we have a short, short but spectacular video for you one that may take your breath away in more than one sense. Let's roll the video. I remember getting out at the end of that swim and looking down at my hands and my hands were, were swollen, they were completely frozen solid, I couldn't bend my fingers. The pain was absolutely excruciating and at that moment I thought to myself, how many more years have you got in you to do this type of stuff? How many more years? There's a price which you pay. There's a price. My motivation is very, very simple. I've been swimming for over 30 years. I've seen the oceans change. And I'm passionate about trying to protect these last wilderness areas on this earth. These areas are so, so special. I remember a few days ago when I was down there by the emperor penguins and you just see how harsh their life is. Over 30% of the little baby penguins, they die in the first year and they just don't need the additional pressures which humans put on top of them because of climate change and also because of this massive industrial overfishing which takes place here in the Southern Ocean.
Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. For years, he has been swimming in the freezing waters of the Arctic and the Antarctic to call the attention of the world to the plight of both the North and the South Pole. Yeah, it's Lewis, he's uh, my hero, he's gonna protect this uh, continent. And for me, it's, I'm so happy to come here because it's, uh, it's in Russia we say, it's better one time to see than 100 times to hear. Some people say that uh, oh, Lewis has got loads of experience. This isn't hard for him, he doesn't get cold, he's superhuman. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I've been swimming now for the past six months preparing for this swim. Freezing cold, many, many days. It's hard. In the moments before a swim, it's absolutely crucial that one, that one is psyched up, but is not psyched out, okay? And you've got to really, really focus and just get your mind ready. Uh, because these swims are so dangerous, because I'm now going to be swimming through a tunnel with ice on top of me, in water which is about zero degrees, and ice which can fall down, and moulons which can suck you straight away down to the, to the bottom, you know, hundreds of meters down to the, to the bedrock. And so it's crucial that I calm my mind down, and then just remember I've done the training, the safety's in place, but now you've got to commit, and you've got to commit 100%. And that's the thing about swimming in a tunnel, especially when there's a river through a tunnel. And that is that once you've started, you've then got to go through. And it's this power of, of a made-up mind. And I'm starting here, I'm going through the tunnel, and I'm getting all the way to the end. And nothing is going to stop me from getting there. There was one moment, there was one moment of great tension and utter fear and terror during that swim. I was going through the tunnel, I was about halfway through, and then from above, I heard this almighty boom. It was like somebody had, had fired a cannon straight the way through. And I looked up and I thought to myself, no, please, no, no. I thought, well, is this whole thing gonna come piling down on top of me? And uh, luckily nothing happened. And I swam those last few meters through that tunnel as quickly as I could. I have never, ever been so happy to see the light at the end of the tunnel. To be next to him yesterday, see the way in which he gets into these freezing waters only in his bathing suit is nothing short of science fiction. And everybody uh, ready right now to, to get together as a big team to, to fight against climate change for one reason, for the future life on the planet. I can assure you about one thing, and that is that my determination to protect this part of the world is far stronger than the indifference of any political leaders. I will stand and I will fight for this place, whatever the cost, whatever the cost. He's known as the human polar bear. Lewis Pugh has been swimming in Arctic temperatures for years now. Nice one, Lewis! Wearing nothing but a speedo, a cap and goggles. In 2006, he swam the entire length of the River Thames in an effort to raise okay. climate change awareness. The following year, okay. he became the first person to complete a long-distance swim at the North Pole. Okay, <laughs> that was unbelievable. So, Lewis, uh, how on earth did you first get into this business? How did, you, how did you first get inspired to use your talents as an endurance swimmer to call attention to the 
the world's oceans and the need to protect them. David, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who's uh, tuned in to listen to us. Uh, it's a delight to be able to speak to you today. Uh, I didn't just sort of have a dream and go down to Antarctica and dive in. It, it's, it's been an, an awful long journey. I, I did my high school in Cape Town. And I think that that school had perhaps the best view in the whole world because I was being constantly told off by my teacher for looking out of the window because it looked right down onto the, a beach in front of the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, the person on my left-hand side, Len John van der Waal, became a professional sailor. And the person on my right-hand side, uh, Justin Strong, became the world champion uh, surfer. So this was a school which produced people who had a passion for the oceans. And I started swimming. Uh, and I like to pioneer swims, to do swims which nobody else had done before. I then uh, went to university, I became a maritime lawyer, and then these two passions sort of came together in Antarctica. I went down to Antarctica in 2005 for the first time, mm -hmm. and uh, I did a swim inside a volcano. Now, I had never ever done a swim inside a volcano before, so it was the first thing that I wanted to do. There's an island just off the peninsula called Deception Island, and uh, it's an amazing place because it's shaped like a volcano. It's like a horseshoe shape and you can actually sail into this volcano. And we sailed in, we anchored the ship. And the first thing I wanted to do was swim in, in Antarctica. And so I dived in. And I think that was the moment when I realized that I had to use my swimming and my legal background, my maritime law background to try and be a voice for the world's oceans. Underneath me, I just simply couldn't believe what I was seeing. This place, a hundred years ago, was the epicenter of the whaling industry. There were literally hundreds and hundreds of whale bones, spine bones, jaw bones, rib bones. Some of them were piled up so high that they were literally, I was literally touching them as I undertook this swim. I finished this swim, I sailed back to South Africa, and I said, I, I, I now need to speak up about what's happening in the oceans, because I've seen them change so much over these 30 years. Um, and I think Antarctica is, is the place, the Arctic and the Antarctica, the place where I'm seeing the big changes. So this is where I've been doing most of my swims now. I think it's, it's, it, it's all our futures. Let me, just, let me just end off with your question by saying this. I think all our futures will depend on protecting Antarctica. You know, when you go down there and you see what's happening, and when you go to the Arctic and you see what's happening, I have no doubt whatsoever that we are now facing an existential threat to life on Earth. Thank you so much, Lewis. I'll come back to you uh, with a few questions in a few minutes. But now I'd like to turn over the floor to uh, Jose Maria Figueres. Jose, some thoughts from you on uh, this moment in time. David, thank you so much. Thank you to the Wilson Center for convening us to talk about this very important challenge and also, of course, to uh, Pew Charitable's Trust. Uh, I have to say, I've seen that video of Lewis. I was down there with him. Every time I see the video, I, 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 I feel in a different way. Uh, the experience of being down there and of seeing what's happening. And I want to take a few minutes, if I may, David and friends, to point out three things, where we're coming from, where we are right now, and the future that we can build together. So we're coming from a very, very uh, precarious position with respect to the environment, the ocean, Antarctica, and our life on the planet. I say that because uh, I'd like to share very rapidly five considerations to that respect. First of all, the United Nations just came out in these days signaling that we missed the 20 Aishi goals that were set exactly on almost 10 years ago to the date on October the 29th in 2010 that had to do with biodiversity. And we have not been able as humanity to fulfill any one of those goals. Secondly, um, the Global Ocean Commission issued this report in uh, June of 2014 uh, that is based on science and on good economics that maps out a roadmap for recovery of the ocean. And we haven't really moved forward the way we should have 
in these six years in terms of the eight crystal clear recommendations. Um, last year, the IPCC issued a report on the state of the ocean. And again, tremendous preoccupation amongst the scientific community for the way that the absorption of carbon, additional absorption of carbon that the ocean is uh, performing or that is subjected to is causing increasing acidification uh, and challenges with the health of the ocean, killing our corals, of which we have lost 50% in the last 50 years, for example. And then you had the WWF report that just came out about a week or two weeks ago, saying that we've lost 70% of the biodiversity in the last 70 years. Uh, so those are the five elements that I wanted to mention that make me believe that we're not coming out uh, in the best of positions. Where are we today? We are all united by this crisis, which affects us all, and we should all work together to double down on the things we know we need to do with respect to preserver, preserving our environment, preserving livelihood on the planet, which is really the only way forward. And history shows us, uh, David, that every time humanity has gone through a big important challenge, we have accelerated coming out of it, sometimes in a not such a good direction, but often in a very good direction. My hopes are that we come out of this crisis working together in a very positive direction. And what is that positive direction? And with this, I finish. To me, there's an opportunity here to double down on helping our biodiversity make it, to double down on climate change. We need to lower carbon emissions by 50% by the year 2030 and to double down with respect to the ocean's health and create 30% of marine protected areas out of the ocean, which is 70% of the planet's surface. And that's where Antarctica comes in because many of these goals that I have mentioned will take us to 10 years, but in Antarctica, we have the opportunity this year to make a dramatic change. We celebrate this year 200 years of the discovery of Antarctica. What a birthday present for humanity to declare these MPAs that you talked about. And David, if you could please show the map around Antarctica to uh, share with our audience what we are talking about. So the three marine protected areas that are up for being declared are the East Antarctic uh, Marine Protected Area Proposal, which you see on the right hand of your screen, the Weddell Sea Proposal, which you see at the top, and then we have the Antarctic Peninsula MPA, which you see on the left side. Those three marine protected areas are the four million square kilometers that David mentioned in his introduction. They would be the single most impressive, important, and largest act of conservation by humanity ever. But friends, we can be much more ambitious. Look at the main nine on the left bottom part of this map. There are no claims there. The main nine could be declared a marine protected area. And think of a humanity that comes together of 25 nations in Kamlar, that is the governing body of Antarctica that meets precisely in October, November this year, that would be courageous enough to set ourselves the goal of declaring the entire Southern Sea around Antarctica a marine protected area. That would move us up to the 30% that we need to conserve by 2030. And Antarctica plays, and with this I finish, a critical role with respect to climate change and with respect to the ocean. We can bring down the map, I think, David. Thank you so much. It plays a critical role with respect to climate change because as you can see, 35, square, 35 million square kilometers of white are a huge reflective shield that reflect the sun's run sun rays that hit the earth back out there, helping us keep it cooler. And of course, in the deep waters of Antarctica, is where the chain, the food chain begins, 
that then swells up and is taken by currents all around the ocean, feeds about 40 or 45 percent of total ocean's biodiversity. That is the richness of Antarctica. That is why we need to protect it. That's why Lewis swims in those waters. And that's why we need to come out of this crisis working together to improve the quality for all human beings on the planet. Rosemary, thank you so much for that uh, perspective. I'm inspired to, to do more at this very moment. Uh, but the next thing I must do is turn the floor over to Andrea Kavanaugh. Andrea, your thoughts on, on this now, please. Sure. Um, thanks so much for uh, um, having me. And it's always a pleasure to share a screen with you, Ambassador Belton and Jose Maria Figueres and Louis Pugh. Um, I, I can only echo the amazing things that Jose Maria Figueres just said, that the Southern Ocean is incredibly important. It's way down there at the bottom of the world. People may not pay it much thought, but it teems with life like whales and krill and seals, but it also regulates the global climate and it droves ocean circulation that carries the oxygen rich waters and nutrients that support marine life and fisheries in so much of the world, just as Jose Maria just said. So warming in the Southern Ocean will have re repercussions both within and far from these icy waters. And that's why it's so important to protect this place. And study after study continues to show that one of the best ways to do this is through large marine protected areas, areas where no fishing or other industrial activity is allowed. And they convey numerous benefits like conserving biodiversity and eliminating stresses like fishing. And then these ecosystems in turn help build resilience in the face of a changing climate. So adding and expanding protected areas in the Southern Ocean would ensure that these relatively undisturbed waters remain a natural laboratory for studying how marine ecosystems react to a warming and acidifying ocean. And it would help preserve some of the most pristine and intact ecosystems left on the planet. Um, as you'd said earlier, Dave, that 2020 was billed as the year for nature. And in some respects, it's proving to be exactly that. Nature is teaching us that we need to get serious about how we exist on this unique planet. Many of the meetings and events were pushed, um, that were to push the ocean protection agenda um, were postponed to 2021. But the need to act remains. And CAMELAR, the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, the body that governs the Southern Ocean, is scheduled to take place later this year. And this is one of the very few things that government leaders can do together in a multilateral form to make um, conservation progress in 2020. It's incredibly important. It would actually help us reach one of those IHG targets that um, Jose Maria talked about. It would help us get to at least 10% of the Southern Ocean, of the entire world's ocean being protected. And it would be really nice to be able to come out of 2020 at least meeting one of those targets. Okay, Andrea, and to all of you, thanks so much. I, I will have a few questions for you, but at the moment, I want to um, advise our audience that you uh, have the ability to send in your questions and comments to these speakers as well. I'm going to share my screen now, and you'll see in a moment, I hope, yes, here we are, um, the addresses you can use for doing so. Uh, if you prefer Twitter, you can send your questions to at Polar Institute or at Wilson Center CEF. Uh, if you're an old school guy like me um, uh, and you prefer email, there's the email address, claire.ald-brokish at wilsoncenter.org. Um, Jose Maria, let me turn to you. Um, you've been advocating uh, for these types of actions for a long time. How receptive have the uh, world leaders and the governments they uh, represent been to the messages you're conveying? Who still needs to be persuaded that we need to act? Well, of course, the crisis, as Andrea just mentioned, has meant that many important events, meetings, summits that were going to be held this year around issues dealing with biodiversity, ocean, and Antarctic, Antarctica have been postponed. And at this point in time, uh, we are under the risk that even Camelot 
may be postponed, which of course we have to work against. Handler is a meeting of only 29 nations, which as Andrea mentioned, is a governing body of Antarctica and 25 nations, I said, I'm sorry if I said 29, 25, and 25 nations can easily meet as we are meeting here today to discuss the issues that are at hand, namely the enacting of these three marine protected areas totaling 4 million square kilometers. Some countries have been more forward coming uh, than others. We still need to uh, bring over the finish line uh, countries like China uh, and countries like Russia. And I think that this is a great opportunity for these countries. Um, they are global players uh, in every way, shape, sense, and form. And for them to come out as global leaders in a world that needs to reaffirm leadership with respect to the environment and the ocean is a fantastic opportunity. Think, David, for example, for Russia. I mean, Russia, Antarctica was discovered by Admiral Bellingshausen, a Russian admiral, 200 years ago. For Russia to celebrate the birthday of the discovery of Antarctica by fully committing itself and bringing along the other nations to declare this is a fantastic opportunity. So we continue to work with them uh, and we continue to have high hopes and expectations uh, that this will not be one more postponement, that this will be rather action, already a first action coming out of the crisis. Thanks so much, Jose Maria. Um, Lewis, on that same subject, I understand that you actually traveled to Russia sometime after the swim that was captured in the video we saw earlier. Um, what was your experience there? What was the reception you received? Uh, what are your thoughts about the possibility that Russia will support these proposals? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so straight after the swim myself and uh, Slava Fetisov went straight to, to Moscow uh, for discussions. But she just got some photographs so you can just get an idea of, 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 of what it was like. But my endearing memory of that was walking across Red Square and my feet were so incredible. I don't know if you've walked across Red Square yes. before, cobbles, right? And my feet were really badly frostbitten. And I was walking into the Kremlin to have these discussions. And, and previously we had, I'd done a swim in the Ross Sea and then gone to Russia and engaged with Slava Fetisov and Sergei Shoigu and Sergei Ivanov and the Minister of the Environment. And, and, and cold water swimming is a language which Russians understand. They understand determination, persistence, things like that. So uh, it, it then helps in facilitating the protection of the Ross Sea. So now it's, I've just done the swim in East Antarctica and I'm walking across Red Square and I'm thinking to myself, my feet are so sore. I can't do a swim in East Antarctica and in the Weddell Sea and in the Antarctic Peninsula. I'm getting on now, I'm 50 years old. So I went in there with the instructions of Jose Maria Figueres, and he says, you go in there, we need to have the big enchilada. We can't keep going back every single year asking and asking, asking, because this is so important for all of us, especially Russia. So the first sort of, the first big meeting I had was, was with uh, the Russian Geographic Society. There's Arthur Chilingarov, the, the, yes. the famous uh, Russian scientist there, and that was a, a constructive meeting. But I think the most constructive meeting was, was in the Kremlin uh, with, with, these, with these men here. That's Sergei Ivanov. Sergei Ivanov started with President Putin in the KGB and then went on and became the Minister of Defense. Uh, he was his chief of staff. And then he um, most recently was appointed as the ecology czar. He's absolutely passionate about protecting the environment and, and, and his real passion is big cats. He's got a passion for tigers and more tigers and things like that. And this is Dmitry Peskov over here. Dmitry Peskov is President Putin's press secretary. And there was Slava Fetisov. Slava was the man who came with me down to Antarctica. And the reason why uh, I invited Slava to come down there was 
he he's such a special person. He would be to Russia what maybe Muhammad Ali was to America or what Pele uh, is to Brazil. He transcends sport. He won two Olympic gold medals in ice hockey and he's deeply passionate now about protecting the environment. He's now in the state Duma and his responsible responsibility is youth and the environment. And so we, we had the discussion there and it was a very frank discussion. I said to them exactly what, um, what Jose Maria said, that an opportunity exists now where there are no downsides. There really are no downsides at all. You know, in 1961, Antarctica was set aside under the Antarctic Treaty. Now this was at the height of the Cold War. 1961, Antarctica was set aside, the whole continent, for peace and for science, okay? And the Soviet Union was one of the signatories, America was one of the signatories, and the Southern, uh, the southern Hemisphere countries were the other signatories, Britain as well. So those Probably initial too. countries came together and said, we have to do something right now. We now face that same situation because it didn't properly protect the waters around Antarctica. And it's the waters around Antarctica which are so vibrant and so important for all of us. So now is the, and this is what I was saying to the Russians, and I say to all the nations, now is the time for Antarctica to be set aside for peace, for science, but also for wildlife. When we go to Antarctica, we go as guests. This is not our home. There's something fundamentally wrong about us pushing animals literally to the edge of extinction. I'll never ever forget being at Deception Island because those bones of those whales, they're still there today, preserved a hundred years later in those crystal clear waters of Deception Island. And one would think that it is a reminder of man's potential for folly, but it isn't. Because first we came for the seals and took them all out. And then we came for the whales and took them all out. And now we go for the Antarctic toothfish and we're hoovering them up. And now the even industrial fishing uh, fleets going down there and catching krill, the tiniest life down there in the Southern Ocean on which absolutely everything, everything relies. We don't have to learn the lessons which we learned a hundred years ago, pushing the blue whale into extinction in the, in the Ross Sea and in other parts of Antarctica, we don't have to learn that lesson. We today can create the, together the single largest protected area uh, on this earth. And it's very, very exciting. You know, very few times does one have the opportunity to bend history, to change the trajectory in which we're going. Today is an opportunity for that though. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, we have some questions that are starting to come in from the audience, <clears throat> and I will turn to them in a moment. But first, Andrea, one for you from me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there have already been some protected areas created in the Southern Ocean, including the world's largest to date in the Ross Sea. Um, why is it so important that we create more MPAs in this area? Thanks, David. It's really important um, to look to the science. That's what I always and, and what my organization, the Pew Charitable Trust, wants to do is look to the science. What does the science say is needed to protect vulnerable species, ecosystems um, from not just fishing that's been taking place for a while, but this new and increasing threat of climate change. And what the science says is that it's not just 10% of the ocean that should be protected, that in fact it's 30% of the ocean. And Camelar recognized this quite long ago, and they were the ones who themselves set themselves a goal of creating a representative network of marine protected areas all um, around the continent in the Southern Ocean. And that means a representative of every ecosystem to make sure that all these places would be protected for the future. And so it's not just that you know, conservationists or environmentalists think this is important. The science says it's what you need. Having these marine protected areas creates spillover benefits in terms of fishing outside of the MPAs. 
and it will serve as a place for um, to make it easier for uh, species to adapt to a changing climate. So it's, it's really important that we have all of these areas protected and at least 30% in the Southern Ocean and in the world's global ocean. Okay. So now um, from our audience, uh, we have a question. I'm not sure to whom, so I'll look to any of you who care to answer. It's from someone in uh, World Parks Incorporated. The question is this, since CAMELAR is going completely remote this year, as virtually all meetings are, um, they're worried that there may be less emphasis on achieving stated goals and missions. And how can we ensure that 2020 is not lost uh, due to you know, the virtual nature of these meetings? Um, I, could, I could just add that as a longtime diplomat, uh, a lot of the success that is achieved is achieved through meetings in the hallways and uh, discussions offline, as it were, things that are harder to do virtually. Um, how, can we, how can we manage this year's CAMELAR meeting to be successful? Any thoughts? Uh, I can jump in. Um, so, you know, that, that is very true. In 2020, lots of things have been canceled. Um, so far, the CAMELAR meeting is still on and happening. Um, it will be virtual, um, which means that it will be shorter in length and we will have less opportunity for those side conversations, the dinners, the, mm -hmm. the events and things that, that make uh, diplomacy so much easier. But um, I think there have been other ways that we've been, we've encouraged bilateral agreements, uh, bilateral conversations between countries, um, and then ad hoc ministerial level meetings. So we, we've heard that the EU is, is hoping to do something like that with the different countries and Russia and China to get them together ahead of the CAMLAR meeting to talk about these proposals in particular. Um, so we certainly hope that um, Russia and China and all the proponent countries do have that time to get together and specifically talk about the CAMLAR MPAs because that will give them extra time outside of the CAMLAR meeting to make some progress on the issue. Let me, let me add to that, if I may, uh, Please. by saying that uh, we all have a responsibility uh, to act in this respect, because independently of whether our country is a member of CAMLAR or not, at the end of the day, every nation on the planet is an Antarctic nation. What happens down there in terms of preserving biodiversity, in terms of preserving the climate system on the planet affects us all in a positive or negative direction. So we have been working at different levels uh, to push this agreement going forward. For example, in our group called Antarctica 2020, of which Lewis is a member, Andrea participates, uh, Slava Fetisov is also a member. Um, we have talked to President Piñera Chile and Argentina being the proponents of the East Antarctica uh, Marine Protected Area. Pascal Lamy and Genevieve Pions, uh, who are also members of Antarctica 2020, have talked to President Macron, who has put this on the highest level of his political agenda bilaterally with Russia, China, and other CAMLAR nations. We have spoken to Teresa Rivera, the Minister of Environment of Spain, Spain is the secretariat of the CAMLAR meeting this year. So there's a lot of conversations going on, understanding fully that political leaders today are challenged with the enormity of the crisis that we are facing, but also to remind them that in a crisis, true leadership looks at the immediate and urgent, but at the same time, at the medium term and long-term objectives which will make this planet a better place. And protecting Antarctica is right square in that capacity. There's a lot that people at the, at, at, people that have never heard about Antarctica, but that may hear about this conversation or may hear about these issues, they can help putting pressure on their governments. Uh, we all need to help the political leadership of the world see past the crisis, elevate their sights to see the world that we want to go into 
and help us this year with Antarctica. And, and one last thing, because I, I don't want to leave this out. I'm sorry for being so long-winded. So Andrea spoke to the importance uh, of listening to the science in dealing with Antarctica and declaring these MPAs. I want to talk to the importance of listening to the economics beyond the science. Studies over and over tell us that the blue economy is worth today almost 30 trillion dollars. That is what we're talking about, the ocean-related economy. And that there are almost 4 million jobs that depend directly from that blue economy. This is about the economics. This is about the environment. This is about the science. But this is about the ethics and the morality of helping this world be a much better place. Thank you, Jose. Maria, um, Lewis, I have a question uh, from someone you may, may know pretty well, uh, Evan Bloom, a former colleague of mine, uh, head of the U.S. delegation uh, to Camelar for many years, also uh, leads U.S. diplomacy in Antarctica generally. He asks, in your view, what is the ongoing significance of the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area in the current effort to establish a network of MPAs all throughout the Southern Ocean? How, how important is the Ross Sea? Well, just to give you a little bit of background, the Ross Sea is, Andrea, is it 1.5 million square kilometers? 1.6. 1.6. Um, actually, 2 million square kilometers if you include the area under the ice shelf, which you want to, because that's part of the MPA. <laughs> right, so it's the single biggest protected area on land or in the sea. And when David Ainley, the uh, American scientist, first proposed it to when uh, it was finally signed, it took 17 years. It took 17 years. It's astonishing. Because on the one hand, all of us are seeing the science and we realize we've got to move fast. We've got to move very, very fast. We're facing an existential threat to life on earth. We need to move fast. And yet on the other hand, you know, we're not selling secondhand cars. Diplomacy takes time. <laughs> you, know, you need to build building blocks. You need to have create trust. And the work which the Americans and the New Zealanders did with Russia and China to get the Ross Sea across the line was very, very important work. And getting that first very big MPA, thanks to the work which you did, David, and, and Evan Bloom did, was, it was inspirational. I'll never, ever forget being in London and getting a WhatsApp message <laughs> that Russia was about to sign the deal. I can honestly say, because I, you know, I swam in the Ross Sea, and it is the most terrifying place on this earth that you can swim. And it was just the happiest day of my life. I just pray that we don't get into technicalities about managing the Ross Sea, which prevent us from getting the next three MPAs up and running. Okay? We don't have to have perfection. But what we do have to have is we have to have these other MPAs up and running as quickly as possible. One of my big concerns, and it's going back to, to what Jose said, and he talked about the economics, he talked about, the, uh, about justice. I worry about how many world leaders have been to the Arctic and the Antarctic. Now, I appreciate if, you, if you're in America, many of your leaders have been to Alaska and places like that. If I look at my own country, Great Britain, and I look around the cabinets, I look around the House of Commons, I look around the House of Lords, I look at the top... FTSE 100 CEOs and ask how many of them have actually taken the time to go to the Arctic, to go to the Antarctic, because these places will determine our future. How many of them have actually taken the time? It's very, very few. It's minuscule. We can't go to bed at night and drink a cup of hot cocoa and listen to Sir David Attenborough's beautiful movies and believe that we have done enough and that we know enough. You've got to go there. You've got to speak to the scientists. You've got to understand how it's going to affect your business or your country, and you've got to take action right now. And that's my prayer, that it's not just an elite group of 
25 nations plus the EU. It's not just their diplomats who will get this thing across the line. All of us have got to get this across the line. Every CEO of a major corporation should be saying to their leaders, we need this area protected. Every member of parliament, every member of Congress, every member of the state Duma, every member of the Politburo, all of them should be saying to their leaders, this is a no brainer. And what's more, I honestly believe that this is achievable. Yeah. yeah. There, was a, there, so, was a, there was a time in the Ross Sea where I was shuttling backwards and forwards to Moscow, backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And I had nearly run out of money. And I said to my wife, I said, Antoinette, we can't do this anymore. We're going to run out of money. She said, just give it a few more months. And it happened. My request is everybody get involved. This is a community effort to get this area protected. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to point out that the importance of the Ross Sea is that, yeah, it was a proposal put forward by the US and by New Zealand and championed by them. But it's now a proposal that China and Russia have agreed to. It's a Camelar MPA. It's a place that we created together as a group of countries. And it, that, that's so important. That's the, one of the first multilateral MPAs. It sets a precedent for other protecting the high seas around the world. Um, and so protecting the Ross Sea is, is, a, is a great first achievement in getting forward, getting more of these under protection. I recall <clears throat> when the Rossi MPA was approved, the Russians were actually chairing Camelar that year. And I think that actually helped. It was uh, a moment in which Russia can claim uh, some uh, significant credit for having brought it over the line. And uh, I think as Jose Maria was saying earlier, we have another opportunity this year celebrating the 200th uh, anniversary of the discovery of Antarctica by a Russian, by a Russian. Um, we have another question from someone uh, who will be well known to, to all of you, uh, Jim Barnes. He is uh, the board chair of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, ASOC. He asks specifically, what can world leaders do in the next few weeks to convince Russia and China to join the consensus for the pending Antarctic MPA proposals? He wants to know NGOs, including ASAP, Pew, others have tried numerous initiatives, um, but he thinks we need to engage leaders at even higher levels to engage directly. What are your thoughts about strategy tactics in the, com in the coming weeks? Can I just start off by saying that just the other day, um, <laughs> President Ursula von der Leyen of the EU actually had it in her State of the Union that they wanted to make sure that the Southern Ocean was protected, that they want to see the uh, marine protected area proposals go through this year for the greatest and largest act of protection on the planet, 4 million square kilometers. And that's great. We need to see high level um, uh, politicians talking about it all the time, but not just once, it's sustained effort. Lots of one-on-one of, of -on -one communication to Russia and China um, talking about what needs to be done. But then I'll leave it to my colleagues to. Uh, Jose? David, I think that this is a fantastic opportunity to show courage, to show leadership, to show environmental stewardship, and to come together as people around the planet mm -hmm. expect our leaders to come together in great moments of crisis, to raise our sights above the horizon and declare the marine protected areas around Antarctica should serve to bring countries together to work on the other challenges that we face in the midst of this crisis. Leaders have ample opportunities to have important conversations. Those are the conversations that should be taking place today between leaders of nations to come together. This is a no-brainer. This is a wonderful gift for humanity at no cost. 
Antarctica is preserved by the Antarctic Treaty for peace and for science, as Andrea and Lewis have mentioned. And to enhance that concept of many years ago in the quest to become responsible stewards of our environment and increase the marine protected areas in the ocean and begin to tackle climate change as we should by declaring these areas as protected is such a wonderful optimistic message for the future that we want to build, which is much better than what we were living in before the crisis. Um, yes, Lewis, to have something to add to that. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd just say the following, that in the next few months as we run up to this Kamala meeting, what can we do? I think there are three things that we have to do. We have to be persistent, we have to be consistent, and we also, most importantly, have to be creative. Okay, in any environmental campaign, you've got to be persistent. It took us 17 years to finally get the Ross Sea across the line. We should get this one across the line much quicker. Persistence is important. And consistency is important. That every single day, we are chipping away, chipping away, chipping away at every single possibility of getting Russia and China across the line. <laughs> The last point I think is the most important, and that's consistent, I mean, that is creativity. We can't, what often happens with, with NGOs is you keep knocking on the same door or you keep trying to open the same door with the same set of keys and it fails one year, two years, three years, four years, you've got to change. You've got to go to new doors with new sets of keys, with new ideas. You've got to come at them with different angles, different, something fresh. And you know that myself and Andrea and Jose Maria Figueres and Pascal Lamy and, and all the people in Antarctica 2020, we are not the, the font of creative ideas. If you have an idea about how to get these precious areas across the line, please share them with us. Because when I said that I wanted to get the Ross Sea across the line and the way I was going to do it, was I was going to sail from the bottom of New Zealand. I was then going to sail all the way into the Ross Sea. I was going to do a swim there. And then I was going to try and go to Russia and get a meeting with President Putin to tell him to protect the area. You know what everyone said to me? You're smoking something very heavy, Lewis. <laughs> but I, in, my, in my mind, I could, see, I could see the link because I had lots of Russian friends, all who loved the environment, all who cared about the environment, and all who cared about cold water swimming, and all who cared about Russia's national interest. So in my mind, I could see it. It took two years to get it across the line, though. And I think that in addition to President von der Leyen speaking directly to the people about the importance of this, and she needs to be talking to Russia and China, and we need um, President Macron and Angela Merkel to be doing the exact same things, to be talking out about why the Southern Ocean needs to be protected and talking to the Russians and the Chinese about how important, particularly this year, it is to show this uh, bringing together a group of, of countries who um, want to achieve a common purpose. And even though there's been all this ongoing background of, of the, the um, COVID-19 and other problems, we can still work together to do something good. So it's up to these leaders to be reaching out right now. They, there's plenty of time left for them to do it. So um, we've spoken specifically about um, ap approaches to Russia and appealing to um, uh, their sort of national interests and national character. There, uh, Lewis was talking about the, uh, the kinds of interactions he had in Moscow on um, his most recent trip there. Uh, what about China specifically? What is the, the message to, um, to the Chinese leaders, President Xi and others, that why, why would support of the, these proposals be in China's interest specifically? They are an emerging world power. Uh, what, is it, what is it we can say to them that would be persuasive in your view? Anyone? David, I think that being a world power as China is definitely today, 
brings with it a certain uh, set of global responsibilities. Uh, you cannot be a global leader in some things and shy uh, in all the good things and then shy away from those others that you would rather not tackle. No, it comes all together. And uh, people are more and more and more aware of what true global leadership means and requires. So for China, a global power today to assume its global responsibility with respect to extraordinary stewardship vis-a-vis -vis the environment is part and parcel of their leadership. I cannot think of how they could possibly, or anybody could think of dividing the responsibilities of a global power between things that they do in geopolitics or whatever, and things that they're doing in the environment. That is not a license that we should give any nation in the world. If you look at China and see what they have done with respect to climate change, they are coming way from behind. Half the solar panels installed in the world last year were installed in China. Half the windmills installed in the world last year were installed in China. The economies of scale that they are bringing to electric transportation are lowering the price of electric cars and enabling us to make that transition as well. I am sure that China will see in this an opportunity to step up to the plate and be the equivalent of the global leader, which they are already in many of these other issues. Okay, thank you. Other thoughts about particular approaches to China? I, uh, I'll tell one story. I was uh, part of a small US delegation that traveled to Beijing uh, to try to work out some concerns that they had at the time with the proposal to establish the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area. We were not meeting with the highest level officials, but we were, we were meeting with people uh, for whom uh, solutions to these uh, concerns they had were, were critical in order for them to make recommendations up. And we made some reasonable progress, but it wasn't enough. It actually came up in discussions between uh, then President Barack Obama and President Xi, who was visiting uh, shortly before the Kamar meeting that year. Um, are those the sorts of interactions that might help again, help again this year, with China in particular? Absolutely. And, and, and everything that can be done mm -hmm. that should be done. We've just seen a EU-China summit. Mm -hmm. uh, we're sure that the issue of the MPAs uh, in the southern seas was raised. Uh, we have high hopes and expectations. Two days ago, uh, some of us participated in a conversation with Premier Li Qishang, uh, organized by the World Economic Forum with 500 top global CEOs. It was refreshing to hear the Premier talk about climate change and the responsibility that China assumes in that respect and that we all should assume. I think that there is an opportunity here to step up to the plate at no cost, because declaring these marine protected areas in the southern seas around Antarctica comes literally at no cost. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in that are asking about slightly broader issues, sort of using Antarctica and the proposed uh, MPAs as a, an example. Um, one question is, um, why 30%? Why, why is the target now worldwide uh, to protect 30% of ocean space by 30? Is it just a slogan or is there some, some hard science behind it? Mm -hmm. Any of you wish to speak? Maybe Andre already mentioned this along the way. What are your thoughts? Uh, there are study after study actually that show that 30% is, is the new, um, the new, target of protection that's needed in order to maintain uh, ecological health, maintain key fish and other ocean populations, other ocean species populations. It's important for humans in order to be able to um, be able to continue to use the ocean as a food source. 
Um, so th there are lots of studies that show that 30% that is, is needed. And um, we can certainly probably put those up later on at the, at the Wilson Center site if people would want to see those. But let's even be more ambitious uh, 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 with respect to that target, uh, David, and raise a bar because we want to come out of this crisis in a much stronger position as humanity. So if you look at the high seas, which is about between 40 and 43% of the total ocean surface, uh, and you say, why not protect the entirety of the high seas? The high seas is that part of the ocean that is beyond the territorial waters of the countries that have coastlines. There are only less than 15 nations that fish in the high seas, and they can only do so because it's so far out. They can only do so because they are highly subsidized by their own countries. Uh, they provide less than 1% of the total employment in the fishing industry. Ridiculous. Let's declare the high seas a marine protected area. And think of the replenishment potential in terms of biodiversity alone in the high seas and how it would increment the fishing possibilities of fishermen in 144 countries that have coastlines, territorial waters, and that are now going through the challenges of seeing our fish stocks depleted precisely because of overfishing. And that, again, comes at virtually no cost. Less than 15 nations fishing out there thanks to subsidies, making no economic sense. Let's be more ambitious. Let's fix this planet. So um, one of the things in the, um, uh, the year of nature that was postponed was um, some rounds of negotiation, a round of negotiations on what might be a new UN uh, treaty that deals with the areas uh, of the ocean beyond national jurisdiction. And the, the, the point is to conserve the biodiversity there. Do you have hopes that this treaty, once it comes into force, uh, can help in this respect? Or uh, Jose Maria, is it not enough? I, I think it's another very important component. It will be uh, a very important component of UNCLOS, the law of the seas, uh, that when it was enacted back some decades ago, did not fully understand the importance of already tackling the challenge of the high seas or the, that are called in the UN jargon, the BBNJ negotiations. Uh, but there again, I feel that the postponement of coming to a conclusion of these negotiations in the UN should be used by all of us to elevate the, the, the standards, to become even much more ambitious in terms of what the science and the economics are telling us uh, that would be required from a scientific point of view to conserve the ocean and the economic benefits that that conservation measure would give us. So we need, yes, the BBNJ negotiations to complete, but let's take advantage of this lag in time because of the crisis to up the ante and bring it up to a much more elevated scale. Thank you. So we have a question about uh, enforcement. Suppose uh, the proposals around uh, for MPAs around Antarctica or uh, other areas in the high seas are actually adopted. How best are they to be enforced against violations? Suppose fishing vessels or other, um, other craft engage in activities that are prohibited in a high seas MPA. How can they be better, uh, best enforced? What mechanisms do we have? Andrea is probably best, best tasked with what, what, the, the measures which we had in the Ross Sea provisions. What did they say, Andrea? Well, so because the, the Ross Sea MPA, it falls within the zone that Camelar manages, they have their own enforcement mechanisms. They do um, have, um, things like centralized VMS to see where tracking where vessels are, um, as well as electronic catch documents of where they've caught different fish to find out what's where the fish have come from. 
Um, but I think now in this day and age, even more globally, we have this, this fantastic ability to be able to look on satellite at different vessels in the ocean in real time to see what they're doing. You can, you can see what they're doing based on the pattern that they're doing in the ocean. Are they fishing or are they just um, drifting? Uh, are they transversing an area? So it's, it's really easy to look at these vessels and see what's happening. Um, and, and then you can know, and then you take it to the appropriate body. So if, for example, someone thought there was a uh, vessel fishing illegally in the Ross Sea, they could take that evidence to Camelar, and then Camelar has mechanisms um, on compliance to uh, look at um, how they would want to either do they want to blacklist that vessel, um, say that they, they, can't, they can't fish anymore in Camelar waters, that sort of thing. I'm, and, and if I may add to that, we Please. have a, a, a multiplicity of new instruments uh, that we can use. Uh, Andrea was talking to uh, technology, satellite imagery. Uh, in the minute that she took to talk about that, I pulled up on my phone, uh, Global Fishing Watch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, And this is a map of Argentina and Chile. All of these little dots are boats that are out there. If I put my finger to one of them, it will tell me the boat's name, uh, what flag it's carrying, what it's supposed to be doing, et cetera, et cetera. So Global Fishing Watch and others are doing fantastic use of technology. We could equip every fishing boat with, an I, with a transponder, uh, have the International Maritime Organization, IMO, uh, enact, uh, uh, not legislation, but enact regulation that would require every fishing vessel to carry an IMO, trans, uh, I'm sorry, a transponder so that we can track it wherever it is. We also have international legislation that has now been and is coming into place. Uh, the PSMA, the Port Measure State Authority, uh, which gives countries the obligation to inspect vessels that are coming into ports to see if they have IUU fishing uh, or if they have been fishing in places that they should not have been fishing. Uh, so we have a, a, a set of, of, of combination of technology, regulations, uh, international agreements, uh, much more awareness. Is it perfect? No. Had we ever faced this challenge as humanity? No. Can we continue to improve what we already have? Of course we can. But we already have enough out there to get on with it and uh, really start using it to the advantage of what the science tells us we should be doing and what the economics tells us is good judgment. So we only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, we started, Lewis, with you. And so I'd like to ask you the last question, at least briefly. What's next for you? In, your, in the video we saw, you uh, gave a hint that maybe, maybe your years doing this are coming to a close. And yet listening to you speak gives me a very different impression. What's, what's next on your agenda for this, uh, uh, this sort of work? Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, it's so frightening swimming underneath the ice. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember the night before, you know, so I was in my tent and I hear the wind blowing and you realize that the next day you're going to go down there and you're going to swim underneath the ice. And the Inuit people, they, they, uh, they say that in every single person there's a massive battle taking place between two wolves, a good wolf and a bad wolf. And that whole of that night before the swim, all I was thinking about was the possibility of ice falling on my head or getting extreme hypothermia, or even worse, getting sucked down one of these moulons, which go all the way down to the bedrock and then you're going straight out to sea. Uh, luckily, I was able to get my mind right just before the swim. But I will make this undertaking to you, David and Jose and to Andrea, that I will not stop. I will not stop swimming in Antarctica until that continent is properly protected. And the next big moment, obviously, is the Camelot negotiations now. I pray that they're not postponed. I pray that Russia and China come with the enthusiasm they came to, to, uh, to the Ross Sea negotiations at the end. But also, uh, in addition to marine protected areas, obviously, the United Kingdom is hosting the climate change negotiations, COP26, 
uh, in, in Glasgow. That's going to be a very, very important, um, uh, probably the most important international conference ever. Okay. And yeah. I plan to be there and I plan to be speaking up on behalf of properly protecting these last great wildernesses left on this earth. Fantastic. Friends, I'm sorry we have to end here. I'd love to continue the conversation, but we're out of time. To those of you who've been watching and contributing questions, thanks so much to you and uh, join me in thanking our wonderful speakers today, Louis Pugh, Jose Maria Figueres, Andrea Kavanaugh. Thanks to the Pew Charitable Trust for uh, co-convening this with us. And we look forward to success at the Camelar meeting this year. Thank you all. Cheers. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye all. Bye-bye.